So today we'll be talking about living donation. What does it mean to be a living kidney donor? Uh, the objective of the talk I will describe the different methods of assessing uh, kidney function pre donation. I will read the guidelines regarding acceptable kidney function pre donation. And uh, probably more than half the presentation will be about recognizing the post um, donation long term risk. Um, Mainly because if any of these donors get any renal issues in the future, they will refer to the genealogy clinic. So we'll see what their risk of having in the future. So um, I got this data from the OPTN as of December 31st, uh, 23. Uh, since 1988 to that date, there was about 570,000 total kidney transplants. Um, about two thirds were from deceased donor and one third was from a living donor, about 180,000. Last year, we have about 96,000 patients on the wait list. We did about 27,300 uh, kidney transplant. About three fourth were uh, deceased donors and uh, one fourth was a uh, living donor, about 6,300 living donors uh, last year. So when we evaluate donors, we look basically at three things. Number one, uh, the demographic risk uh, in the absence of donation, age, sex, race. Then we look at the clinical characteristics in the absence of donation, like their blood pressure, their GFR, any mm -hmm. service smoking, their BMI. And the third thing we look at is the donation attributed risk. And then you see if all these risks will um, reach your uh, program criteria to accept that particular donor or not. And as you can see, we do extensive testing on the donors to make sure uh, they will be uh, good during the donation process and uh, on the long term thereafter. The main thing I'm going to concentrate on today is uh, assessing the kidney function pre-donation. So as you know, GFR cannot be measured directly. So we need either exogenous or endogenous cellules that are mainly eliminated by uh, glomerular filtration to estimate uh, the AGFR, the GFR. Uh, and both me measured and uh, estimated GFR are associated with error in their determination. So for example, if you look at the 2009 CKD EPI equation, it's the least bias among the equations for the EGFR, but still the accuracy within 10% of measured GFR was only 50%, especially when you go above 60 and above 90 GFR, the accuracy is not really great. What about cystatin C? So cystatin C, if it improves um, the accuracy, especially if you do the A6 race, uh, adjust the cystatin C. The best among these is if you use both creatinine and cystatin C. As you can see, in EGFR above 90, um, only 2% were more than 30% different, and about 16% were more than 20% different. And almost the same for the group between 60 to 90 uh, GFR. It's still not perfect, but it's, it's probably the best um, equation to use for the EGFR estimation. The second method we use is creatinine clearance. So given the cost, resources, and time intensiveness, and sometimes I like of availability of measured GFR, a lot of centers just go with a uh, 24 hour uh, yeah. urine creatinine clearance. As you know, due to the distance secretion of creatinine, creatinine clearance overestimates the uh, GFR by 10 to 20%, creating a positive bias. And uh, another limitation is the accuracy of the urine collection. Sometimes you have to repeat it twice or three times to get it as accurate um, as we want it to be. And we use usually the um, uh, creatinine excretion for males 20 to 25 milligram per kilogram and for uh, females 15 to 20 milligram per kilogram for accuracy of urine collection. How about measured uh, GFR? So in the visual GFR, you basically use exogenous filtration marker. So they give it and then at the time intervals after you check for either plasma or uh, renal clearance. So historically inulin is the, is the best one uh, because it's a free filter in the glomerula, it's neither secreted nor reabsorbed in the kidney. The other four that's clinically available are uh, EDTA, mainly used in Europe, 
uh, DTPA mainly used in the States, uh, Iohexol, which is probably um, the cheapest one out of them, and the Iothalamin. <laughs> so if you're not, it's a busy slide, but it's really, it does comparing uh, all four to anywhere. So if you look at the, um, this is DTPA, EDTA, um, Iohexol, and Iothalamate, and the dark spots, um, is the uh, renal clearance and the white spots is the uh, plasma clearance. Uh -huh. um, you can see um, from the numbers, the DTPA, the EDTA, the plasma and renal clearance performs really good. Um, the iothalamate renal clearance performed good. In this uh, meta-analysis uh, systematic review, there was not sufficient data to recommend plasma clearance for iothalamate. Um, Iohexol plasma clearance was good, and there was not sufficient data about the uh, renal clearance. So these are the, the best four if you're going to choose EDTA, uh, renal or plasma, Iohexol uh, plasma, and iothalamate. <laughs> DTPA wasn't really great. Renal was much better than the plasma. The plasma, they don't recommend that. Um, there was no significant, no, no um, assumption data to uh, recommend using uh, EDTA the plasma clearance. So regarding the guidelines to accept uh, kidney donors, um, so previously uh, there was a, some guidelines about the fixed cutoff EGFR of about 80. And that was a bit uh, mainly dependent on the outcomes on the recipient side. You know, when you have a donor uh, EGFR of about 80 recipients did well. But there was another study on the donor side that showed if the EGFR was above uh, 80 uh, over a period of 40 years, about 85% still had um, GFR above 60 on the follow up. And none were below 30. So it seems like 80 is, is a, a good cut off um, in general. However, more recently, more and more guidelines are recommending um, BSA adjusted GFR uh, based on age and sex. Um, and then the EGFR shouldn't be less than two, two standard deviation from the mean for that adjusted BSA for age and sex. Uh, there was a little bit older a survey for the transplant centers in the States. 90% used measured creatinine clearance, whereas 10% used uh, a creatinine clearance of exogenous filtration marker. Um, among those, 67% were using 80 uh, EGFR as a cutoff, and 20% uh, used uh, threshold based on age and sex. What do we use here? So, uh, we use um, age and sex specific GFR, especially for the older donors above 40. For the young ones, you, the cutoff is really 80 to 90. So if it's in 20s, 90, if the 30 is 80. But for the older one, we, we go by the age specific um, uh, to be with the two standard deviation. That makes sense. I mean, if someone wants to have a baby and you're taking half the kidney function, you're putting them in. Markedly increased. Yes. So this is the mean GFR, and this is a study that goes back to the 1950. It was done about 10 patients. And to, to believe it or not, it's probably the, the main source for the mean GFR up to up recently. Uh, but you have to get this is a typo from the paper, it's uh, in your link clearance. Um, <laughs> It's it's a lot of uh, recent data based their studies uh, and uh, on, on this. The um, measured GFR that we use is uh, a little bit less than the inulin. So this is not a good reference for the measured EGFR we use. So I looked up more recently. Uh, there, this is a, a, a paper from Mayo Clinic on about 300 uh, uh, living donors using iothalamate. And it's really good because it's not only give you the mean for the age, it also gives you the fifth and 12.5 percentile, which is approximately that two sided deviation. And this is using iothalamate. So it's very close to what you use here. And you can use it 
in general, for the cutoff for the age specific, um, for the Asian specific uh, uh, geoform. And the third paper I found also published um, two or three years ago. Um, they look at the measured GFR using IFLMA trainer clearance, and they look uh, at the creatine clearance and EGFR. And they found if you, so, creatine clearance overestimates EGFR, the EGFR using CKDB AP underestimates. If you take the average, it will be very close to the measured GFR. So if you have a center that you don't have the ability to do measure GFR, probably this is a good way to estimate uh, a donor kidney function. What do we use here? We have measure GFR. Oh. We use the DTPA. Mm -hmm. So it's a busy slide, but I will summarize it in two things. This is the Kidiko guidelines. It's really simple. They say number one, anyone above 90 is good. Anyone above 60 is not good. And anyone between 60 and 90, you need to go through the ESRD calculator score online, and we'll go over that. The second recommendation, they, they recommend to do two-stage testing. So number one, to have EGFR like CKDP, just for screening, and then you should confirm it. And you can confirm it by three methods, either another EGFR or cystatin C or measure GFR or creatine clearance. The British is a bit more complicated, um, but I think probably it's more uh, practical. So they did uh, about 3,000 donor, and they looked at the mean GFR, and in this study, it was EDTA, and this was the cutoff based on age uh, of the um, donors. And then they had this two standard deviation above the mean and under the mean. And they said, we want the GFR post donation, which is 75%, to be still within two standard deviation of the mean. And they established cutoffs based on that. So as you can see, up to about 40, EGFR needs to be above 80 regardless. When you go to the older age, you're going to deny a lot of donors if you stick with the 80, because the mean is, is, is lower. So you go up to 80, 50, 80 is the cutoff. <laughs> so, um, and that's still, so that EGFR, according to the calculation, the 75% of that will still be above the two standard deviation for that age. We don't accept donors who are 80, typically, <laughs> but uh, this is the uh, British guidelines. And um, for the age specific, I think probably this is um, this is the best to go through uh, during donor evaluation, especially if you have an older donor with borderline uh, kidney function. Um, so this is just a summary. Um, so we spoke the British and the Kidigo, OPTN doesn't have really specific recommendation, but in general, they recommend a GFR above 80. The Canadian, they have also age-specific criteria. Let me just show it to you. It's really simple to remember the Canadian. It's the easiest. So for younger, 90. For middle-aged, 80 or 85. And for older, to be 75. Um, the European, they recommend um, age-dependent GFR. <clears throat> Uh, such that the EGFR of the remaining kidney will be more than 37.5 at the time the donor reaches age of 80, which is approximately the uh, minus two standard deviation for that age. Um, Australia and New Zealand, they recommend against EGFR under 80 for donors. For Amsterdam Forum, which is was a conference with transplant nephrologists and surgeon, so again, they recommend 80 or uh, 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 and negative two standard deviation to be uh, precluded. However, they say it was not a successful transplantation from some usually elderly uh, living donors with GFR as low as 65 to 70, um, indicating the individualized donor assessment basically for whoever under him. So, in general, it, it's mainly divided into some guidelines with 80 cutoff. And other lines depending on uh, the country age and specific mean uh, GFR to be within uh, two standard deviation. Uh, just one more thing that the British and the Canadian they recommend if the what if the size difference was more than ten percent different between the right and left kidney, uh, you should get um, a nuclear scan 
and the Canadian recommended if it was more than 50%, so it was one kidney was 53 and the other kidney was 47, so you should get the take the list functioning kidney to be doing it. Um, this paper, actually, they tried to estimate post-donation um, uh, GFR based on the pre-donation TR creatinine or major GFR. So in general, we say it's going to be about 70 to 75%. But here they put this equation uh, based on age because the compensation for the remaining kidney might be a little bit different as we age. For example, I used uh, the um, CR creatinine, if you want, uh, for a 50 years old with creatinine of one, uh, their uh, major EGFR will, will be about 64 at three months post donation. If you want to use a major GFR in this equation, I tried 100, for example. Um, and again, they end up with about 64%. It's, so it's close to what we say about 70%. But if you want to be really sure, and if it's the borderline, I want to see how, how much uh, uh, EGFR the donor will have post donation, I think it's a good tool to use. And how many patients did they give it? Uh, that's a good yeah. question. I'm not really sure, but, but it was in the hundreds. It was in the hundreds. All right, so for post-initiation long-term risks. Um, yes, sir. so your albumin is not included in the evaluation at all? Uh, in the pre-donor evaluation, it is. It is oh, one of the okay. things we can do. No, I, I just mentioned the name of the kidney function, just the EGFR measurement. But we look at all the others. Though. But I'll come to that. I'll come to that in a second. About the measurement of the creatinine mm -hmm. and albumin and protein. Mm -hmm. So somebody has... Just so I understand, if yes. somebody's got a urine albumin has a measured EGFR, measured GFR of 85, yes, and they're 30 years old and they've got a urine albumin of 500 milligrams per gram creatinine, are you going to accept them as no, no, okay, yeah, no. So, so I didn't go over the full medical evaluation of the donors because you know you have the kidney stone patients, you have the protein urea, all that stuff. So, I just concentrated on the kidney function because it will help us for the long term risk. That's why I just considered on the kidney function. For the protein, anyone with albuminuria or proteinuria, they are denied for donation. Okay. So for the long-term renal function in a kidney donor, so this was a paper from the 1980s. They looked at about 38 uh, living kidney donors, uh, and they compared it to their uh, um, uh, siblings. And as you expect, they found getting to be 20% higher, EGFR was 20% uh, lower, there was no difference in the hypertension and no, um, and they noted also increase in proteinuria post donation. In the 1990s, there was another paper. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Y
and they matched it to uh, control from the country. Um, and they looked at the mortality and ESRD risk on the long term. The first thing among the donors, uh, the majority, about 1,500 out of the 1,900 donors were first degree relatives. They did not match for that in the control group. The second thing, the follow up was 15 years compared to 24 years on the control group. So there was some problems with the study. However, the data showed um, about nine donors developed ESRD 0.47 compared to about 22 in the control group. Uh, the median follow up from donation was 18 years. The majority of the cases were due to neurological diseases. Um, and after imputation and of missing values, they ended up with a hazard ratio of 11.38 for ESRD post donation. And then they compete for other risks uh, for ESRD cardiovascular, and they excluded EGFR under 80, and it was still the same. And then when they looked at the mortality, they found that uh, <coughs> Uh, the hazard ratio was 1.3 for mortality and for cardiovascular death was 1.4. So this was a little bit um, in, in new at that point. And however, this paper was critiqued. So number one, because the first degree that it would have high risk of ESRD and mortality, you need to match for it. So this paper uh, did a critique on that and then with the did the uh, uh, consanguinity mass controls, the, this dotted line is the actual, will be the actual mortality rather than that one. And the red one is the donor. Still there's difference on the long term, but it's much less than what they reported. And the same year, another study from the US was published in the uh, JAMA. They looked at a very large number of donors um, 96,000, they did match it to uh, 9,000. 9, um, as you can see, there was a difference in there. And so what they did, the mass healthy and donors were drawn with replacement in light of a larger population of donors than uh, of healthy and donors. The follow-up was 15 years, the median follow-up was about six years. 99 uh, donors developed ESRD, 83 of whom were related to the recipient. So when they looked at the ESRD risk in the US, they again found there was increased risk of ESRD at 15 years after donation. It was 13.8 per 10,000 compared to 3.9 per 10,000 in healthy non-donors. The absolute risk was highest in the uh, black population, 74 compared to 23. In the Hispanic, it was 32 compared to 6.7. And in white, it was 22 compared to zero. So it should also increase risk um, of ESRD post donation, and the hazard ratio is about um, uh, relative risk is about eight in this population. Um, here they looked at the age, so they found that older age had higher risk. Race: black males were the highest in the white population. White men, a relationship to the recipient versus not related also. And they look at the year, and the older years had a higher mortality than the recent years, although the follow up was a little bit longer in the, in the older uh, donor. So then in 2015, there was this study by Grams et al. Probably it's, it's the, the best among of them. They uh, had uh, a large number of donors with mass control, and uh, they found. They look at three things here. They look at general population, unscreened non-donors, uh, live donors, and healthy non-donors. And they found out that the donors had a risk of 90 per 10,000 compared to 14 per 10,000 non-donors with absolute risk of 76 per 10,000. Uh, nonetheless, the donors were still well under the, um, the general population risk of 326 per 10,000. And based on this, they established this online calculator. Probably uh, most of us use it during a living donor evaluation. So it gives you the risk, the ESRD risk, 15 year ESRD risk, 
the predenation risk, and through simulation, also they give you the predenation lifetime risk of ESRD post donation. However, it doesn't give you the post donation risk at donation. So this is just baseline at the time of donation. And it's about 10 factors you put in and you get the score. So the question will be, what will be your threshold? When, the, when they apply that calculator on the actual donors in the, in the US, 99% of donors had 15 uh, a year risk of ESRD less than 3%. 98 was under two, 94 was under one. So the majority were under 1%. I personally, I, I, I go with one person. Because if you have, as they showed, you have to multiply back that. In their study, it was about five fold increase risk. So black men, 4.8, black women, 4.9, white men, 5.3, white women, 3.5. So it goes about 3.5 to 5.3 increase risk. So once you get the, the pre-donation calculator, you can see what the predicted ESRD is with donation. Quick question. Yes. With that 1%, did they determine uh, any long-term outcomes of the donor as far as all cause mortality or cardio? No, this is just, they, they just reported on, if they apply the calculator, what was that, the risk pre So I'm still troubled by, or confused by the control population. Mm -hmm. you know, the risk of the SRD clearly runs in families. So did they do control studies where they looked at siblings of the donor as the control population? No. This was all just general population uh, surveys, like nutrition surveys or cardiovascular survey. And they, they choose the donor, and they didn't have any contraindication among that group. They put it as healthy non-donors, and they compared it. The only studies that were the no siblings was the first two studies, like 50, 60 years old, uh, 50 or 60 uh, donors. It was very small numbers. Okay. Yeah. So um, this is study 2016 by Ibrahim et al. They looked at 15, 30, and 40 years, and it saw also increased risk of 78.7 per 10,000. Uh, female were, were less, um, younger, this was the white population, younger were less, older were more, and also relationship to the recipient probably was the highest, one or three per 10,000, compared to people not related to the recipient. So for the composite endpoint of Egypt are less than 30 or ESRD, can it was back, experienced. Can you go back to that last slide? So if the risk was related to the donation, it wouldn't matter if you were related to the recipient or not, right? So the fact that it's like a fourfold difference, if you're related to the recipient, your chance of developing the SRG is four times higher than if you're not related mm -hmm. to the recipient, which says that for me, I interpret that 75%, 80% of this quote risk is genetic that you're related to the recipient and has nothing to do with donation. With donation. Am I misinterpreting? No, so you're, 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 you're right. Or environment. Right, right. Yeah. Environmental. But that has nothing to do with the donation. Yes. Okay. However, that being said, in the US, the majority of donors are related to the recipient. So it's a population you need to study. You cannot attribute to the donation itself. I disagree. But, but you need to know the outcome, though. But, you know, what, it, when you're counseling a potential donor, what you want to know is what's the increased risk related to donation, not what's the risk of donation, not, not what's going to happen. If, if they are related to the donor or not. If they're related to, to the, the donor. Yeah. 80% of the risk of ESRD is unrelated to the transplant, and it's related to genetic, environmental, social consideration. Mm -hmm. could, otherwise, you can get people information that's going to increase the risk of their refusing to them. Now, now, I just wonder that it's incorrect, that it leads patients to the incorrect conclusion. 
the yeah. overwhelming majority of donors who develop ESRD were related to the recipient, but again, most of the donors aren't actually related to the recipient. The life unrelated donor things are actually related. So, so it comes to that attributable risk yeah. in donation, yeah. how much that increases, because they're relevant anyway, that, whether they donate or not. What I'm saying is that may be hard to say because the uh, denominator in the life unrelated group is not the end in the non-related donors are not much. As no, you can to get your controls own. from the family of those who yes. get transplants who didn't donate. That's what the was saying in his script. Right, but they didn't get those controls, which can make the study more hard to interpret. But I agree, it should be two ways to cut the to talk to the patient or the potential donor and explain the risk related to losing one kidney. As a gift, right? To receive it. And these well, are the risks because you're going to do it. You don't have a, a, the data on the non donor recipients, right? This is all mass. That's why you have you can do the study. Otherwise, you need something to study from now up to 40 years and compare these two. It's, it's, it's a difficult study to do, you know? On the, on the short term, you're not going to detect it. We're talking about 20 plus years, and you need these non donors to follow up with you and do all the things that you want. So it's not an easy study to do. However, um, if you have someone who is related, uh, I, I think you should, they should be counseled that probably they have a higher risk, not because of the donation, just for being related to the receiving. Because the data shows that they have a increased risk. You cannot just say, you know. The, the other thing, this is applies to all kind of ASRD causes. However, if there is something which is genetic, that's a different story, like PKD or uh, HUS, we check the donor with genetic testing for these disorders. Is there any risk calculator related to family history? Also, not uh, I think uh, one of them does. Not, not this one. But another one, I'll show you if you put it there. Uh, well, so, none of these studies have looked at the underlying kidney disease of the recipient. One of them did. I'll come to it. I'll show you. I think. Um, so in this uh, in this population, among the 112 who developed the endpoint of uh, under 30 or ESRD, the median age was 68 years old, full up was 24 after donation to develop the endpoint. It was associated with older age, higher BMI, and higher baseline systolic blood pressure. 28 donors developed ESRD, full up mean was 25 uh, years post donation to develop ESRD. The overwhelming majority of donors who developed ESRD were related to the recipient, 96%. Causes of donor ESRD included immune mediated GN, uh, HUS, scleroderma, hypertension, renal cancer, and one cardiomyopathy, and one of the others. I have a question. Is the living related donation include spouse donation? No. And then they looked at the risk factors. What if patient develops any of these. So except for diabetes, which was a little bit surprising, the other ones all can increase the uh, outcome of death. Um, all of these can increase outcome of proteinuria, and all of these can increase uh, risk of Asia, Asia for under 30 or ESRD. So if you have a donor who develops any of these diabetes, um, high blood pressure, proteinuria, they need really uh, close follow-up. And this is up to the 40 year of donation. You can see, um, accumulated incidents, a lot of them will end up with EGFR under 60 with high blood pressure and the other outcome, uh, as you can see. Okay, so this is a study by Macy, uh, published in Jason 2017. Very large number of donors, 133,000 from 1987 to 2015, predicted 20 year risk of ESRD for the median donor was only 34 cases per 10,000. And as you can see, a male had a adjusted hazard ratio 1.8A, a black race 2.96, 10 year of age uh, was uh, 1.4 hazard ratio for the white population. However, in the black population, it was better to have older black donor. The BMI per five is adjusted, uh, adjusted hazard rate of 1.6, and first degree biology related recipient adjusted hazard ratio of 1.7. And as you can see, um, younger uh, uh, black donors, and in the white, the older white um, donors were the highest risk among uh, these two groups regarding ESRD post donation. 
And we developed a score based on this study for the ESRD. This is the second online calculator. Um, and it included uh, the sex, race, age, BMI, and the relationship to the uh, receiving of this one. And as you can see, they report 5, 10, 15, and 20 year ESRD risk per donation per 10,000. Um, in this study, uh, they look at the, e, the GFR and the uh, proteinuria post donation. And as you can see, the donors, you, the EGFR actually goes up for the first probably three to five years before it starts going down compared to the uh, control group. So the control, as you can see, it goes down by 0 0.5 to 1.5 per year. And the donors, it actually goes up, up to about three years before it starts coming down. Um, the blood pressure uh, was um, not different. Red proteinuria was not different. However, PTH, uric acid, homocysteine, and potassium were higher in donors. Hemoglobin was lower in donors up to one year. Then it was um, equal to the control group thereafter. Um, another also study that published 22, this is a Canadian. They looked about the same at the EGFR trend post donation. They compared it to control. So the control, the non donors, about minus 0 0.5. Uh, eight five per year decline in GFR, and the donors it actually keep going up to about five years before it start uh, going down thereafter. Um, this paper in AGT they looked at the ESRD uh, and uh, risk of ESRD in prior living kidney donor, and this was a retrospective study um, from nineteen ninety four to two thousand sixteen. They had about 123,000 donors. Uh, Read and fair diagnosis was included related to hypertension, GN, and diabetes. A median follow up 10 years, and the median time between donation and the onset of ESD was 11 years in this study. And as you can see, more years after donation, the risk will be higher. Again, regarding the race, same, the biological um, uh, related versus not related, and the income. And as you can see, male, uh, higher adjusted hazard ratio, biological parent, uh, biological child, the highest was identical twin, hazard ratio of 20. Uh, sibling also, uh, 1.87. Uh, BMI, the higher BMI adjusted ratio per five, because the BMI was 1.34. EGFR donation, the higher the EGFR every 10 points, you get less risk, but just has a ratio of 0 0.89. Uh, for blood pressure, also, it decreases the risk. The race, uh, black versus white, 2.79. Hispanic versus white, 1.98. And other race versus white, 1.5. Age increase in the white population gives you increased risk of 1.26. However, in the black population, the age increase is less, um, will give you less risk uh, for ease and after. For the income, for the low income, the better was also uh, with uh, just actually with less risk. And we did this heat map, and as you can see, the highest risk was in young black male donors, um, 111 per 10,000, uh, young black female, and older white male. And the best white uh, females does well with donation in general. Especially if they are if they are young. Um, this is a score um, uh, by the University of Minnesota, and this one they actually uh, have the um, donor characteristic and recipient characteristic, and this will be included in the um, calculator if the recipient is related. So they contributed that based on all these studies. And for this one, it doesn't report the ESRD risk. It just it gives you the hypertension, uh, diabetes, proteinuria, and GFR. The ESRD, they just reported what they found in their population. So this th there was this meta-analysis by O'Keefe. They looked at 52 studies, about 118,000 118, donors, average follow-up one to 24 years. 
and they found that the uh, relative risk for ESRD was higher by about ninefold compared to the control. However, the absolute risk of ESRD was still low, about 0.5 even per thousand person years. So there's increase of relative risk, but the absolute risk is still really low. And the actual, if you want the absolute number, the most recent reported from um, 18, 1987 to 22, from the SRTR data in the US, there was a 633 living donor who developed ESRD, which is about 0.4% of the This is just a summary of what, so, uh, of the papers I showed you. So for the mortality, the only one that showed increased mortality was the Norwegian study with, with all that problem, problem with that study. Otherwise, there was no difference in mortality in the other ones. And the ESRD, as we said, it, the relative risk was anywhere between uh, five to eight in the US population. How about hypertension, increases of hypertension uh, post-donation? So there's conflicting data about that. Um, in one meta-analysis, it showed that there's about five uh, uh, millimeter uh, mercury increase in blood pressure within five to ten years um, over the anticipated with normal aging. In a retrospective study, it demonstrated a 2.4 increase risk of hypertension post donation in the African American uh, compared with mass control of the same uh, population. Um, Sanchez is all at all, they published a paper just on hypertension after donation, and they looked at the risk factors. So in their paper, they found about 26% of donors developed hypertension um, at um, uh, 11 point, 11 point nine years follow-up. Um, but if the, the longer follow-up, about 40 years follow-up, about 50% developed hypertension. And they found also the use of ACE or ART also was associated with lower risk of EGFR under 45 and also less risk of ESRD. So these, these were the, uh, the risk factors to develop hypertension, post-donation, age about 50, uh, family use of hypertension, high BMI, systolic blood pressure elevated, the acid blood pressure elevated, and hyperlipidemia at the time of donation. And if you had more than three risk factors, the hazard ratio would be up to 3.18. The meta-analysis by O'Keefe, they showed that the diastolic blood pressure was slightly elevated, but there was no difference in the systolic or risk of hypertension after donation. How about the cardiovascular risk? So um, they studied all kinds of parameters and measurements to look at that. So there was a multi-center parallel group blinded endpoint study of living donor, uh, about 124 from March to August 2020. Uh, 11, 2014, and it shows significant increases of left ventricular mass and mass volume ratio, whereas the aortic distensibility and global circumferential strain was decreased. Donors had greater risk of developing a uh, sensitive proponent, a detectable highly sensitive proponent, uh, serum uric acid, PTH, uh, FSG23, and uh, C-reactive protein were all increased significantly. And change in GFR was independently associated with change in lift ventricular mass. And there was another study, uh, a smaller number, about 38. They looked at the uh, interleukin 3, um, VCAM, and all these were elevated post donation. They looked at the ischemia induced flow mediated dilation of the brachial artery at one year, also was decreased compared to baseline and three months post donation. And in their multivariate analysis, uh, serum uric acid, estimated GFR, and BCAM levels were the independent predictors of the FMD at 12 months after kidney donation. However, in the more recent, uh, larger studies, uh, one was the Ernest study. They looked at about 469 participants, and they showed that changes in ambulatory blood pressure and pulse wave velocity in kidney donors at 12 months after nephrectomy were small and not different from controls. In another five-year prospective study, there was also no significant difference in the changes in LV or left atrial volumes at five years after donation. So a larger, more recent study didn't actually show the same data as the ileal the ones. 
by the meta-analysis by Okie, they looked at about 12 studies that made their criteria to include them, about 112 donors, and they found no evidence of increased risk of all cause mortality, cancer, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, or adverse psychosocial health uh, risk in living donor compared to the control participants. <laughs> How about gout? So there are several studies that show that there is increased risk of uric acid in donors to compare to control. Lamet all did a paper just on gout post donation, and they found that the gout um, uh, in the donor was 3.4 compared to 2% events per 10,000 uh, person years with hazard ratio of 1.6. And also more donors were prescribed as a perineal cultural compared to non-donors. And donor subgroup at increased risk of gout include American, African American, older group, and men. How about preeclampsia? So I'll I'll um, go out more detail about preeclampsia because uh, the data is more consistent about increased risk of preeclampsia and uh, post donation. So um, this was a single study that included about a thousand women with three thousand pregnancies. Uh, fetal and maternal outcomes in the post donation pregnancies were comparable to published rates in the general population. However, if you compare post donation versus pre donation pregnancies, uh, it were associated more with a lower likelihood of full term deliveries and higher likelihood of fetal loss. Also, it was post donation pregnancy associated with a higher risk of gestational diabetes, gestational hypertension, and preeclampsia. Uh, women who had both pre- and post donation pregnancy were also more likely to develop these ad uh, adverse maternal outcomes in their post donation pregnancies. So the, their conclusion was that fetal uh, and maternal outcome and pregnancy outcomes after kidney donation were similar to those reported in the general population, but inferior to the pre donation pregnancy risks. Another paper from Korea, they looked at about um, 112 donors and they matched it with about 67, 672. Uh, non-donor and uh, nationwide, they found that the gestational diabetes or preeclampsia were more common in the kidney donor, 8.9 versus 1.8 with a, an odds ratio of 2.68. However, the incidence of severe gestational hypertension or preeclampsia requiring antihypertensive medications were comparable. Uh, the time from donation to delivery within five years and primarily were risk factors to develop preeclampsia post donation. The low birth weight, still birth, active pregnancy were all similar in both groups. But I guess that, you know, if you're comparing this to the general population, I don't think that's your approach. I mean, this is a healthy population. Yes. This is screened. This is not the general population. It's not the fair comparison. Yes. In the general population, yes. but the general population is getting pregnant. Yes. It's not a fair comparison. Um, in this paper, they looked at the outcome if the donor developed preeclampsia during uh, pregnancy, what will be the long-term outcome after that? So uh, they had 85 uh, with one woman with 131 pregnancies. Uh, gestational hypertension or preeclampsia were more common among living kidney donor than among non-donor, 11% 11, 11 versus 5%. Uh, so it was about double the risk. There were no significant difference between donors and non-donors with respect to preterm birth, or low birth weight. And there was no reported thing also to look at living unrelated donors mm -hmm. yes. versus living related, related donors. Yeah. And it was the previous slide. It looks like how solid is that finding that having a pregnancy five years or after donation somehow is a risk factor? If they were within five years of donation, donation right? That, that, well, I don't know how solid that is because yeah. it's an important point. Yeah, and primary. Mm -hmm. Another important thing about the slide is that it's Korean cohort size, right? So yeah. very you know Different narrow population, population. Yeah. not applicable, you know, at least when we practice in the US. So here they had 384. 39 developed preclampsia, eclampsia, 29 gestational hypertension without preclampsia, and 17 developed gestational diabetes. So those who developed preclampsia or or uh, eclampsia. They had uh, increased risk of hypertension in the future uh, with a uh, hazard ratio of 2.39 if they develop gestational hypertension and 2.70 if they develop preeclampsia. Also, they develop preeclampsia or uh, gestational diabetes 
they had also increases of developing diabetes after that. So it's not only the risk of developing preeclampsia we're concerned about, is the risk if they develop preeclampsia, what's the outcome after that? However, in this paper, actually, the, the pregnancy related complications were not associated with increased risk of cardiovascular risk or EGFR under 45. So at least they didn't progress quick or have high risk of ESRD after in that, um, uh, in that population that they follow. In the meta analysis by O'Keefe, there was about uh, two studies they looked at and meet their criteria to include, and there was no evidence of any of the maternal um, outcome regarding the burn and the, um, uh, and the fetus. However, um, again, it showed that there is increased risk of preeclampsia with a relative risk of about 2.12. The incidence rate of preeclampsia per 1,000 pregnancies was 5.1 events in donors compared to 3.1 events in the control participants. Um, this is uh, the most recent paper. They looked at 93 articles with about 114 uh, uh, pregnancies, and the uh, absolute risk for donation was 1.3% compared to 4 to 10 percent post donation. Uh, the risk for adverse feed and neutral outcome was not different. Anymore. So does living donors have CKD? So a lot of time, you know, they go to their primary doctor at the end of 1.5, they put the CKD stage three. Uh, we don't like to call donors uh, to have to be CKD patients just because they are they had like we had an instruction that they are donors. However, if you look at this uh, few things that they share with CKD patients, so of course decreased EGFR, increased PTH, increased FS, FG, F23. Uh, decrease circulating flow, though, increase uric acid, inflammatory markers, and troponins. However, they are different. Usually, they are normal tensive. Their EGFR is stable. They don't have this progressive decline that you see in CKD. Um, high urine albumin is uncommon. They have normal arterial stiffness. The circulating grass is not activated. Normal lipid metabolism and normal pro BNP. So in summary, um, assessing living a donor kidney function accurately is a very important part of the pre-donation evaluation and the medical decision to proceed with donation. Uh, there's different guidelines regarding the EGFR cutoff. It mainly divided into either fixed GFR or age and fixed space. Uh, most long-term studies show significant increased relative risk of ESRD post-donation compared to healthy non-donors, but the absolute risk remains very low and lower than the general population. Uh, most studies show no long-term risk of increased mortality or cardiovascular risk post-donation. Uh, data are not consistent regarding hypertension post-donation. And there's consistent data showing increased risk of preeclampsia, hyperacemia, um, and gout post-donation. Thank you.